attention to details is always the name of the game in our field. Before you even start doing your first procedure, I would advocate practicing going through the motions. It'll help to be able to hold the gonial lens on the cornea without indenting the cornea. It'll help uh, getting used to having two, using two hands so that you're holding the gonial lens with one hand and inserting an instrument across the anterior chamber into the opposite angle with the other and making sure that you're able to keep your view and that you don't get corneal striae, things like that, because if you can eliminate some of those factors, it will significantly reduce your stress the day that you're actually doing the surgery. You want to use high magnification so that you can really see the anatomy. The problem with high magnification is that you lose depth of field and so you'll very easily go out of focus. So what I'll typically do is um, advocate going high magnification initially to uh, see the tip penetrate uh, into Schlem's canal. And once I'm sure I'm there, then I'll zoom out a little bit so I, my depth of field increases um, as I'm moving uh, you know, across uh, to treat. In the beginning, I would recommend making a, uh, just a standard linear incision. I wouldn't get fancy. Once you have some experience, I would advocate flaring the inner lip of the incision that'll allow you to get a wider treatment arc and I do believe that you can achieve lower pressures with a wider treatment arc. The problem is if the if flaring the inner lip of the incision isn't done properly you can sometimes increase reflux or leakage out of the incision and it can be a little harder to keep the anterior chamber formed. You know the other uh, nuances that I think help to improve outcomes have to do more with post-operative management. I don't use prednisolone acetate or um, uh, Durazol. Um, I use Lodomax or Lodoprednol. These eyes um, get a lot of steroid response. I've seen that so many times that I now routinely use Lodomax um, to manage the post-op inflammation that they get. The other key is performing gonioscopy at every post-op visit and paying really close attention to what's happening in the angle. And in some of these eyes, you will see either PAS forming or you may see a, a sort of a stippled uh, a pigment membrane that starts to form over the cleft. If you're seeing that any of those signs, you need to be more aggressive with steroid use to try to shut that inflammation down and prevent uh, failure uh, from closure of the cleft. Lodomax is not foolproof. You'll still see some steroid responses even with Lodomax. As long as patients are still on steroids, if their pressure is elevated, I don't worry about it. And I'll tell the patients, we just need to be patient. You're probably having a steroid response. And I would say 90 something percent of the time, within a month after they stop their steroid drops, the pressure gradually comes down. Also in the beginning, it's important as far as patient selection to choose patients who have nice wide angles with a very posterior iris insertion. That will reduce the risk of PAS forming. Uh, it'll improve your access to the trabecular meshwork uh, during the surgery. And um, you also want to choose patients who ha do have milder disease in the beginning until you get comfortable uh, you certainly don't want to try it in someone that has more advanced damage um, or that has had any uh, predisposition to ocular inflammation. I already had some experience doing angle surgery, um, doing other procedures. So uh, I guess in some sense I had an advantage there, but for a surgeon who has no experience with angle surgery, it's a completely different feel. And that's why I really advocate taking the time, even you know, two, three months before you do your first case, to start practicing going through all those motions. Uh, it'll make a huge difference in the long run. I think there are two separate aspects to that question. There's how long till you're comfortable, 
how long till you feel like you're getting good results. <laughs> and those two aren't necessarily the same. Um, and I think that it probably took maybe 20 to 30 cases before I started to feel comfortable and probably maybe 40, at least 40 before I started feeling like I was getting some decent, consistent results that I could count on um, when I was talking to patients or trying to choose which procedure to perform on a, on a patient. One last point I want to make um, pertaining to inflammation, which is a lot of people will um, you know, tend to think if, the anter if there is no inflammation present in the anterior chamber, then it should be fine to quickly wean the eye off steroid drops. I tend to be a little more aggressive with my steroid use initially. I'll typically start patients out with every two hours at Lodomax yes. uh, for the first week. And if there is still any anterior chamber inflammation at a week, um, I may potentially uh, continue every two hours for an additional week or two before I start to taper them down. And then when I taper them down, I typically will uh, take six to eight weeks to slowly wean them off, um, you know, starting at maybe six or maybe eight times a day and then cutting one drop every week rather than going from eight times a day to four times a day and then weaning them off in four weeks. Because my feeling on this is Unless the pressure has risen markedly and you're really worried about a steroid response that is potentially getting this patient into trouble, which is the exception rather than the rule, for most patients, if you keep them on steroid drops for a few extra weeks, I don't really see any harm to that. Um, but there's a lot of potential gain if you're able to prevent uh, is, you know, scarring or inflammation that leads to scarring in the area. We're not just cutting tissue, we are ablating tissue. We are using energy in that area. And that energy use is going to create some inflammation to the surrounding tissues. So how can you not get a potential inflammatory response from that? That has even changed as I have become more experienced and more comfortable with my results, I will now occasionally use it in patients with advanced damage um, in certain uh, settings. So for example, uh, one gentleman that comes to mind was a, a gentleman who was uh, in his 80s who had advanced damage, had been on drops for years, his pressure was uh, 12 or so preoperatively. He needed cataract surgery and um, he was on three or four meds. And when he came to me, he said he was sick and tired of taking drops and he wanted to get off his drops. And uh, so since his pressure was controlled, I could have potentially done a straight FACO on him, but that would have guaranteed his need to continue using glaucoma drops afterwards. And with a strong desire to try to eliminate his need for drops, I recommended a trabectome because I didn't feel he needed a trabeculectomy. I didn't feel he needed to go even lower. His disease was controlled. So I did a phaco trabectome on him. His pressure postoperatively has been, uh, has remained at 12 on zero meds in one eye and one med in the other eye. You know, he's thrilled. Obviously, he was a little disappointed that he had to go back uh, on one med and one eye, but uh, when I put things in perspective for him, um, he is uh, very grateful.